notion of ancestral relationships being something that's important, worth reclaiming, seems kind of old fashioned in this day and age. We've really lost touch with the idea of even having ancestors. Typically, when we think of that word, even if we do ever use it, we'll often be thinking of that immediate family that perhaps we knew personally, maybe a grandparent, great grandparent at most that we've lost, but again, did have personal contact with. We've really lost any sense of belonging and this sense of lineage with our further back ancestors or even our more than human ancestors that is really something that humans across the world and throughout history have held to be something of utmost importance. So in this episode, with author and shamanic teacher Kathleen Matthews, we dive deep into this topic, why it is important to reclaim the relationship with our ancestors. Who do we even mean when we say that word? And some of the challenges that can come up as we do so, but more than anything, the real gifts that arise as we embark on this reclaiming of relationship with our ancestors. This is a gorgeous episode, one that I really appreciated personally. Let's dive in. Hello, Kathleen, and a huge warm welcome back. Hi there, Leanne. It's lovely to be back. Oh, it's uh, such a pleasure. And um, we've enjoyed our conversation already just talking about names and uh, pronunciations. Before we even get into the very exciting topic of ancestors. And I love that even when we were having the kind of conversation about what we were going to talk about. And I was like, I want to ask what might seem like a silly question. And you're like, no, that's that's the perfect place to start. So we're going to start right there with what might seem like a simple question um, and see what that unfolds into. So the this conversation is all about the the need to include the ancestors. But what are the ancestors? Great. Well, it's the same question that I asked a few years ago. I was at a conference and um, an interfaith conference and. I asked that question of the audience and there was stony silence because <laughs> people didn't know how to answer it. And then a, a friend of mine was in the room. He's an Anishinaabeg Indian. And um, he put up his hand and he said, it's everything between heaven and earth, <laughs> which Ooh. was of the right answer. <laughs> wow. I love that. <laughs> um, it's, it's not how we consider it here, is it? Mm. Um, you know, it's very different here. Um, so, you know, I think for, for Indigenous people, it, it's not just our human ancestors. It's um, it's the bigger ancestors of land, um, hills, wind, rivers, um, as well as the animals, birds, trees, um, and all we share life with. Um, but I'm afraid in in our country, we, we kind of, we live in a society that's really largely forgotten or ignored ancestors. Um, and for most people, it just means the people that came immediately before you whom we remember and mm. everyone else everyone else's history as they say um or in the words of my publisher i i once proposed an ancestral title to him and he kind of went oh well i mean here in america i mean you know we're from all over what would we need with ancestors i mean they're all dead and gone aren't they <laughs> Which was very shocking to me, but no, he didn't take the book because obviously he didn't have the vision to, you know, to see how that would be of any usefulness. But I think, you know, if we haven't got um, connection with what comes before us um, and what comes after us, as well as having a relationship with it while we're here, um, then, you know, we seem to have entered into this very difficult place, I think, you know, where. you know, we've kind of lost our big heartedness, which mm. I think is a real, a real shame and a problem because we belong to this greater ancestral world. Um, and, you know, I know that a lot of the problem here began, <clears throat> you know, at the Reformation because people were still talking to the dead, you know, in a very ordinary and everyday kind of way up to the Reformation. And then 
<clears throat> in the reign of Edward the, the Sixth, even at the burial service where you think you might address the dead directly, it was like our sister here departed, came into the prayer book for the first time, mm. and no one was called by name or spoken to directly anymore. So there was that kind of, uh-oh, now we're in the scary dead time. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I think that since then we've kind of ended up in this kind of horror story, really, um, which is where the ancestors can only appear in a horror story where terrible things are going to happen. And that there's a general mm. fear of the ancestors as a result of that, very specifically in this country, because um, <clears throat> we were not encouraged to maintain that connection. Yes, so we have a we have a lot of uphill work to do, but the problem of that, you know, I think is that um, we, you know, we, we we live in a society now where this life is all that we have, and for many people, um, you know, they don't get another chance. Um, they don't have any connection with what's gone before or what's afterwards, and um, as there isn't anything else and nothing else is existent. Um, then I can do as I bloody well like, can't I? Which is mm. a terrible way of being, which, of course, if we felt ourselves as part of, you know, the ancestry of the earth, of course we would look up for everyone. Of course we would look up for the earth. You know, mm. there's, there's no doubting about it, but here we are. So yeah. It's, it's a bit of a sad way at the moment, I think. Yes, it's... Uh... That certainly paints, I think, a very truthful, but also um, it, it, it is a sad, it is a sad place we find ourselves. As you were, as you were talking there, um, I think it's a line from a Mary Oliver poem where she talks about your place in the family of things. And mm. we've lost that understanding of there even being a family of things. And of course, things yeah. is all of those different being spirits, um, yeah. including our human ancestors. And we've just lost sight that there is even is a family to be part of. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting um, thing that you said is in this country, we've lost We've or this part of the world, we've we've not only lost sight of that kind of wider family of you know other beings on the land, but we've also been very disconnected from the the our human ancestors. You're saying where in other parts of the world there is at least that, yeah. but there there is this sense that you know we can talk about the ancestors that we perhaps knew ourselves remember but anything more than that it starts to take on this like um almost like it would be a superstition um it would be um almost like worshipping something that shouldn't be worshipped yeah. there's a, there's certainly something that it comes with that whereas like that's not the way that you should do things um no. and my sense is that as, and this, I've, I've certainly experienced this myself personally, as I began the work of reclaiming my relationship to my ancestors, in this instance, my human ancestors, there certainly was initially this sense of, is there anything really there? Is this just an idea? You know, like, is, is this me just like playing make-believe and believing in, you know, silly superstitions of something that doesn't even exist? Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, because my sense is there's because, again, we've been so bereft of that way of being in the world. That kind of notion, I think, comes up for many people as, as we step back onto this path. I think, you know, I mean, obviously, um, in Europe, we've had two world wars, which means an awful lot of ancestral displacement mm. and children didn't know who their parents were or where they were or if they were still alive. Um, you know, um, I know one of my teachers talks about Jewish rabbis going around after uh, the Second World War and going into orphanages and just just standing at the front of the class of children who they didn't know whence they'd come. And they just, they just closed their eyes and said the Shema. And if the children cried, they were assumed to be Jewish. Goodness. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was... You know, it was that sort of, how do you identify children? Yeah. You know, but of course now we have DNA, which is a very different thing. But, but you know, there's, it's a kind of false route in a sense, because, yes, it, you know, 
people, first thing you learn about ancestry is that people lie all the time about where they were. Mm. I have a friend whose aunt was born simultaneously in Wales and Ireland, you know, on paper, <laughs> but obviously that couldn't possibly be the truth. And, um, <clears throat> but it just gives us a set of names, dates, and unembodied beings. Mm. Um, and I think that when we, when we look at ancestors, you know, we're looking at a much, much wider thing so that ancestors are in, um, you know, in our, in our living memory, which of course our living memory is, in my case, would be from my great grandparents through to me and from me to my um, grand, great granddaughters whom I don't have yet, but, you know, they may be on their way uh, in a few years. And, uh, you know, those are the people that we each personally remember within a, a living memory. Um, but then there's a whole lot of emptiness. Mm. Only people with pedigrees, um, people who've you know, come from noble families where they've kept genealogy, um, which of course puts people off a lot. But actually, we all come from very old families. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. Um, you know, there's, so there's a whole bunch of ancestors we don't know about. Mm. And then there's the ones before that, whom of course, I think of as the deep ancestors, the ancestors from whom we are all descended um, because we have a commonality. I think it's pretty, you know, it's pretty clear that there are hundreds and millions of people who are descended from, you know, some big kings like Charlemagne and Nile of the Nine Hostages and Genghis Khan and so on. Who put it about it? <laughs> so, um, which kind of, I mean, the Queen's descended from Muhammad, you know, um, and so so is Charles. But, um, but really, you know, those are those are not the. It's not the notables that we're going for. It's the collective consciousness. Mm. Of the I think that this is also um, one of the things that we have within shamanic and indigenous traditions is that, that there's this bigger memory, there's this bigger collective of understanding. Uh, whereas the ancestors who are near to us, where we very often are entangled with and have problems with, and Indeed, the greater part of my shamanic work with clients is entirely based on trying to get to, you know, the, where the interruption happened mm. or what went wrong or, or what keeps recurring in the family and so on. Um, but we all belong. We have these ancestors behind us um, <clears throat> and they'll always be behind us. You know, even though you may have a really difficult relationship with your parents, your grandparents, whatever. Um, Beyond them, there's something else. Mm. Yes. I think that, that's always what we want to remember. And as you know, you know, with a lot of people, when they when they get a power animal for the first time, they kind of think, oh, I wonder what its name is. And of course, it doesn't matter. As long as they recognize it's a deer or it's a badger or whatever it is, they'll always know that badger or deer again. But that, that wanting to get particularity um, is is not what this is about. Mm -hmm. It's about very, very much bigger. Yes, that example of the power animal really makes sense. We're so so conditioned in this culture to need to be able to fully kind of like well, we believe we can fully understand something if we can name <clears throat> it and place it and categorize it and make mm. it known. And we're so used to using um, that tool for <laughs> so yeah. thumbs up there. that tool for um, you know anything that we're approaching that we you know think that's going to help us be in relationship with that thing, that person, yeah. that being. When often it's it's actually what's going to get in the way and be a way that we're limiting that relationship, yeah. limiting that being. The relationship can be so much wider, and I think a nice way of thinking about this. And I was just talking recently at a conference about sacred sites, and um, <clears throat> you know, I was observing that those sacred sites that we see in the land, you know, the big stone circles, you know, the um, the barrows, the monuments, the processional ways, the stone rows, all of these things, the fugus, you know, these were not built by the ancestors for themselves; mm. they were built for us as well mm. oh my is, goodness uh, yes really important, you know, because obviously mm. i mean in the same way that you know apart from salisbury cathedral which was put up in 
59 years, which is one of the shortest cathedral builds oh, ever wow. made. I <laughs> what they call, you know, um, a bit of a quick build. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, but when you built a cathedral, you know, it was generations of people mm. built it. It took so long. Um, and it might take three or four hundred years. I mean, we, you know, we've seen Notre Dame, you know, and the disaster of the fire. Um, they're just about probably going to hit the rebuild, you know, now, but that's, you know, pulling all the stops out. So, but again, those people are not thinking about just having the satisfaction of restoring Notre Dame now. They, they've got a sense of it going ahead. Mm. Um, as I think our ancestors did. So that sense that they were forethoughtful of us, but how are we forethoughtful of our descendants? Mm. So I think, you know, this is really important stuff um, to get to get to and to be part of. And also one of the wonderful things that happens when people really begin to make space for the ancestors in their lives is that they begin to feel less abandoned. Mm. They're not alone. Yes, which is, I think, for a lot of people today, quite a big thing because we have so many huge issues to overcome. And I'm thinking of things like eco despair, for example, you know, where we have to save the earth, we must work this way or that way to do this. But actually, it's a huge, huge burden on a lot of people, and they just give up Mm. because it's just all too much. Um, for them. So I think that sense that we're all working for this is, is one that's a very helpful concept to bring mm. um, bring into the equation. I, mean, I think that's beautiful. There's um, something so... When you spoke about these, these temples, the sites, um, that, as you say, it doesn't make sense when something's taking so long you as part of creating it you know that it's going to last for many generations it wouldn't make sense to spend a lifetime building something that perhaps won't even be finished by the end of your lifetime um and there's something so so beautiful in that so um it's so tangible in that sense of this goes way back in a way that it wasn't wasn't just chance, wasn't just, oh, it happened to be that way. There's some real intention and love as part of that. And it, exactly. mm, there's something really lovely about that. The, um, it reminded me a little of um, the house uh, I'm in at the moment. Um, it's 400 years old and... In a, it's it's not quite the same as you're talking about, but I often have that sense that, wow, this house has stood for you know all of those generations. It was built by someone, which is a similar idea that you yeah. had. They may not have been thinking of it in terms of their direct ancestors, but they were certainly thinking it would it would outlast yeah. them, and indeed it has. And I have the same sense that we're 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 guardians of this house. And then hopefully it will go on and be here for many generations to come. And so I think things like that, where we we are so in this culture again, everything is often done so fast. You know, we're so used to that instant gratification. Oh, I'm going to create this and it's done. And I think anything that connects us back into that sort of slower, longer time frame is helpful to kind of connect us back and forth in the way that you're talking about. Exactly. I think that, you know, the, uh, I mean, you know, it's thought of as heritage, you know, when it's kind of a a collector thing like Stonehenge. But I mean, even even Stonehenge was rebuilt in lots of different Mm. ways by successive peoples who added to it or changed things. Um, You know, much as the Reformation did for us, you know, that um, suddenly, you know, you don't have the inside of a church is no longer covered with paintings that which quite honestly would have looked like a graphic novel if you walked into a church in the Middle Ages because every surface was covered as a modern Orthodox church is just mm. covered. Things going on, saints doing this, angels doing something else, you know, the damned, the saved, um, over the chancel and so on. All of that. So, I mean, it was, you didn't need to read because you could see it. Mm. Um, and, and, and continuous rites tell you things. Um, so, but when people are not connected to their continuous rights 
of their ancestors, um, suddenly there are no ways of doing certain things anymore. Yeah. Mm. So <clears throat> I think these are sort of the you know the things that we end up we end up doing and seeing shamanically um, because this is the this is the work that people want. There's such a hunger, you know, to do that belonging, but then no one's kind of officially allowed to do it and no one sort of gives you the mandate mm. to go and you know they think oh i could just get my dna done which might be a beginning but actually you could start right now yeah <laughs> you know, you could start right now and say <clears throat> is there someone in my past ancestry um who i don't know but who knows me and sees me and looks kindly on me will they please come and stand beside me now because i'm having an operation next week and I'm feeling very frightened. Mm. Yeah. And I think there's a, a university somewhere in the States where they did a they did a test and they gave two sets of completely different people um a very difficult task, like breaking down on the motorway and having to change a wheel on the Oh my goodness. On, on the <laughs> um, <clears throat> which is quite a big deal. Yes. For those of us that you know, don't handle things like car mechanic tools. And um, one lot were told, you're on your own. You've got all the tools. You've got all the tools. You can just get on with it. But the other people were told, you've got all the tools. But also think when you're doing this of the ancestors standing behind you, helping you and, and supporting you. And, um, you know, it was very interesting. The ones who had that thought of the ancestors helping them um, ha had a lot more get up and go to do the job than those that didn't mm. and it's really important often you know when I'm working with someone I always you know do something of that sort and say you know I know you've had like excessive trouble with the family that you're born in but actually there'll be someone a little way back from that who will um before that trouble came upon the family <clears throat> who really sees you um and um, one of my teachers, uh, Dan van Kampenhaar, did some work uh, in Germany, and he was very much aware that in Germany, lots of young men have great difficulty stepping into their manhood because of, you know, the Franco-Prussian War, the First and the Second World War. There's a kind of a, a big, let's not go in this mm. direction. So, so becoming a man is about stepping into your manliness, and it's quite hard. And there was there was one guy who was in the group, and he was saying, "No, I just you know it's just really difficult for me, and I know I'm not the only one." And so he got everyone to stand up. It was a very big group, um, and so he got the guy to choose a person to be his father and someone to be his mother, and then they chose two people, and they and, and the whole room was completely up. So there's this great wow. fan of people, and then because there were so many, the guy couldn't see all of them, so he was put on a chair. So he sort of looks out over them, and, and Dan said to the those of us that you are all his ancestors. Now I would I would like anyone who does not care for this young man or anything about him to please go and sit down. And the whole half of the hall went and sat down. And so there was only like you know a few standing on one side. And Dan said, look out over the people that are left and see is there someone here who you connect with. And about five or six generations back there was one man standing and he was just beaming at him and Dan said okay everyone else can go and sit down I think we've found what we need and they had this wonderful dialogue which was lovely but of course <sighs> that many generations back means it's before the Franco-Prussian War before all this mm. militarism you know sort of afflicted um, the states of Germany so um, and that was a wonderful thing for him because suddenly he felt seen mm. So I think, you know, these are the these are the things that we have to remember. If there's no one rooting for us in our family and no one cares for us and we feel exiled from our family, we're not. Yeah. <laughs> there are there are those behind us who do look at us. Um and also I'd also like to say, because I think this is also very important, a lot of people don't have children, so they feel they're not part of the flow forward mm. of, of ancestry. And in fact, of course they are. Um, because they have other relatives who will have children, so they will have collateral descendants. Um, in the same way, I can't remember the actress's name, but you'll know her well because she's duck faced in um, in the um, in the film um, 
um, for weddings and the funeral. Um, she is a collateral descendant of Jane Austen. Oh, Jane yes. Austen had no children, right? But, mm. but that is is one of her family's descendants. So she is a descendant who could look back on Jane, mm. and Jane could look forward to her. So I think it's very important to say that because people get very upset about I'm not part of that now because I don't have children. Mm. Yes, I love there that. Are, yes, still mm. part of the the wider family. Really beautiful. There's something um, you mentioned about. Um, I may I may be paraphrasing this um, incorrectly, but I heard you say something about um, those kind of rights and customs that were mm. part of our heritage. And what was coming to mind, and I'd love your sense of this. It's given most of the things that our ancestors have done kind of made sense in that context as in often certainly uh, my own experience shamanically has been we we do these things because they they work you know people didn't just do random things for generations after generations for the you know just for the fun of it they were practical they they aided our survival they they're what allowed us to get this far and the more I've understood that and really, I guess, reclaim that connection with the land here, the seasons, what grows, what passes, what comes, what this means, what it, what's being asked for, it, it naturally starts to take you back. You may not have had that kind of, um, you know, direct message where someone says, you know, do this at a certain time of year, but the land and the beings of the land teach you yeah. and there seems to be this um familiarity familiarity like almost a lost memory that we're reclaiming it's like huh yeah i've not been shown to do this but it's almost like i'm remembering something that was shown to me yeah. somehow yeah. once yeah. i mean i think you know i mean what what the what catholics call sacramentals the things we do every day in a holy way i mean the things like building a fire you know or turning on your stove possibly your microwave now you know it's the same action you know sort of sewing sewing your children's clothes mm. um mending mending things these are things that hundreds of millions of people before you have done um tending your garden all all of these things um <clears throat> some years ago um on um in orkney um south ronaldsey um there's a farmer called um, Mr. Simerson who um, went out on his land and he, d he discovered a horned cairn. So it's a sort of, it's a very early Neolithic cairn with sort of um, horns on it, yeah, and, uh, or extensions. And um, he begged for archaeologists from the National Museum of Scotland to come and do some work on it. And they, they didn't for a very long time. And because they got outside the limit of the statute of limitation, he excavated it himself. He learnt how to do that properly. And he unearthed um, the bodies of very, very many people who had been, parts of their bodies, have been obviously excarnated and put into this grave. So the place has been, like most of Orkney, it was Neolithic Central, there's so many things in the ground, and things that they didn't know what the use of them was. And so they actually had a museum in their own house because... You know the National Museum of <laughs> <clears throat> so they had all these wonderful objects uh, which were all properly conserved and nicely. But the lovely thing of visiting was that um, you can't do this now. But they would they would often give you something and put it in your hand so that you could feel the weight of it and sort of feel what it was. And they told me um, that having done this for very many years, that people came from all over the world to see this. But certain craftspeople would pick up a stone and they weren't quite sure what the stone was used for but the person holding it went into the right body position to use it mm. so that's how they had discovered so it was like you know um like a lot of uh reconstruction archaeology which is when you, you try and try and remake the pot or, or find out how to weave a hurdle or whatever you're doing and so they had this wonderful um, vast experience of visitors coming and handling things, and then so they'd worked out what they were for. Wow! But it was like those, that memory oh. was in the body. 
Yeah. Which is just so exciting. Oh, I love so, that. Mm. <clears throat> so I think, you know, we, we have that very physical memory with us always. And, um, and also uh, the memory of ancestors is in us. I mean, for good and ill. Mm. Um, things that, you know, things that skills that we inherit, not just the, you know, the brown hair and the blue eyes, but also the ability to, to be and to do certain things which are just sort of sent down um, people's um, bloodlines. And uh, I think these are very interesting things. But when things go wrong, um, those are the things we need to get to. Mm. Yeah. Uh, those are the things we need to get to because um, that's a wonderful skill. Um, and uh, when something is blocked, it, it can't continue. So I think you know a lot of a lot of the work is about reclamation. It's about getting to the point when um, uh, ancestors who've undergone terrible things um, are relieved of them. Mm. And, and I. And I get this in all kinds of different ways not just um where ancestral lives overlap uh lives now so it's like you're in your own spotlight but suddenly a strange behavior overcomes you mm. uh, so i remember for instance for instance some years ago um I, I was just asked you know i was just doing my taking my notes from someone's case and i said and do you have children of a woman and she just looked at me and this is normally a question you say yes or no to, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yes, it's very clear. You don't have to think about it. Well, she thought about it for 10 seconds. And I said, why are you unclear about this? And she said, well, I might have been pregnant once. And she couldn't remember. And I thought, hang on, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about someone who's got a complete blank on her teenage years? Or what are we looking at here? And it became very clear that this was an ancestor whose affairs and, and general disposition was overlapping her, someone now dead. Mm. Uh, and so it was a matter of, okay, I know now who the client is. Yes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not the lady sitting he's, in front of it. I can deal with your ancestor. And everyone else in the family doesn't have to undergo this strange mm. uncertainty about whether they were, you know. Um, so I think these these things... You know, they come down from very far generations as well as near ones. And I suppose a near one would be like a man coming, you know, I once had who said, um, I don't know what's wrong with me. I've just walked out on my wife and children. Uh, we had a row in the kitchen. I have no idea what was going on. Um, so we went through his case history and I said, you know, finally, I said, well, you haven't talked about your father. Could you say a few words about him? And he said, well, um, you know, he was um, he was a very difficult man in many ways that, um, you know, there was this time when, you know, he just walked out on us. And I said, you know, um, how old was he when he did that? And he said, well, he was 41. And he had a row in the kitchen with his wife. And I said, well, how old are you now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so bless so him. To get a very mm. clear over that like that. And then other times, you know, I might be working on someone and I, I remember, you know, just running my hands um, over someone's body field to pick up as I'm singing into the body field. And I think, oh, my God, what is this? Um, you know, this immense sound. I mean, ca catastrophically loud sound. You know, worse than every rock concert you've ever been to put <laughs> together. Um, and I said, oh, my goodness. I said, no. I said, I'm getting the sense of very heavy detonation of ordnance. And she said, yeah, that would be my grandfather. Mm. He'd, he'd, been in, he'd been in several of the major battles of the First World War and had survived it. But, I mean, he lived in the sense yeah. that he lived, but he was not living. Mm. It was still resounding in him. Wow. So, you know, so it was quite extraordinary. Um, and things that lie much further back. Mm. Yes, but people wouldn't necessarily be able to. In the example, the first example you gave with the pregnancy, my sense mm. was that wasn't necessarily an ancestor that she knew and remembered, but yet mm. there was a, a remembering happening in her body. Yes, indeed. yes. And yeah. mm. that there had been some overlap between her um, and this other ancestor, mm. which of course, you know, 
does happen. And some of these things are kind of unadversarially related. So uh, I know that in some hospitals, if you're going to have major heart surgery, they often ask, you know, is there anyone in the family who had a, a difficult operation at this time? So they, they don't want to take you in for a heart operation mm. on the same day your father died having a triple bypass or something because they they understand that. Although now I, 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 I think it'll be a matter of if you get onto a table at yes. all, you're doing it. <laughs> you'd be well. lucky. Mm. It's just, anyway, um, <clears throat> I'm going to actually see one of those mythical beings next week, an actual doctor. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I haven't seen one for four years. But the, um, you know, this, this, these extraordinary overlaps and things that are often, often overlie a whole family uh, and down many generations, uh, I think these are, these are the things we, we need people working with. Mm. Um, because these are not being dealt with as physical problems. They may be being dealt with as functional neurological disorders sometimes. Um, sometimes, you know, people are being treated psych- psychologically. Um, but actually, shamanic work's the only one that, you know, it's, it's the old Heineken advert, you know, Heineken, <laughs> the, the part of the beers cannot reach, you know, which is... I uh, came to uh, my mind too, yes. This is the, this is the discipline mm. that does that, you know, in, in terms of healing, because, you know, yes, we can physically look at the detritus of whatever has gone on, we can look at the mental state of someone where something has been going on in a family. But you can't, you can't, you know, put an inquisition upon ancestors five or six generations. Mm. No, you can't do that in those disciplines. And so we can, we can actually go to that point and maybe help a whole strand of ancestors that, um, you know, people often think very naively, well, is that all my ancestors sorted out now? You know, after you've done some work, and say, well, no, we've just dealt with <laughs> one or a ancestors. And if we were dealing with anything bigger, I mean, like a factory fire, a famine, a disaster, a battle, whatever it is, we need a lot more people. Mm, yeah. So we need to be doing a much bigger ritual. Mm, yes, so certainly. I was. Um... With the examples you've given, which I think are really wonderful ones and really bring home again the the I guess like the efficacy of this this work yes. and really understanding and relating and including the ancestors in this way, like we do this for a reason. Yeah. It isn't just a kind of fanciful notion. Um, I was also thinking, you know, the examples you've given are ones that are, you know, challenging ones that people came to you because yeah. they were experiencing a problem. Whereas I'd also um, love to hear your experiences and um, sense of the ways, and you you mentioned this, how there's also these kind of like ways of being, these gifts, these traits that we take on from our ancestors. And certainly my sense has been, you know, particularly those of us that have been called to things like shamanism, um, often we can look back and see that that's shown up in different ways, like sort of, I say, heightened okay. sensitivities and openness to other realms that we can, when we have eyes for it, we can see that in our ancestors. Um, and sometimes the two things can um, coincide in that um, early on in when I first began working shamanically, I connected back to my mum's mum who I'd never met she died when my mum was 11 and suddenly realized something I'd never never heard spoken about before had never known in a kind of like an ordinary consciousness sense and suddenly understood this sensitivity that had caused so many health problems in her and then my mum and then me and how it was so misunderstood and hadn't been um, honoured in a way that could actually be used as a gift yeah. um, and so it kind of had shown up both ways it was a gift but it because it was mi- misunderstood it became a problem yeah, but, but every, every gift comes with um, you know it's like every contract comes with yes. small print <laughs> yeah, you know, what mm-hmm. you sign up for you also sign up oh. to small print and of course some of the small print is about how you guide and guard and boundary the conditions of using your gift which means that First of all, you must never use your gift in a way that is going to desacralize it. Mm-hmm. And that, 
because the minute you've done that, you're out of it, yes? Um, you know, you have to, um, you know, you have to do things in certain conditions and in certain ways. And when the gift cannot be used, as in um, a time when people go through repress repressive regimes or particular kind of um, religious um, strictures or whatever it is, that when the gift can't be used, then it becomes intrusive within the person. And so it has to come out some way. And it will often have this other side to it, which is very difficult. Um, and that can, you know, that can result in illness. Um, that can result in all kinds of different imbalances and so on. So I think, you know, if you have a gift or skill, for goodness sake, do the journey. Mm. Check out what are, what's the small print on my gift. <laughs> and, um, I mean, I had a wonderful experience of this a few years ago. Um, uh, we were very poor at the time. It was some time after the net book agreement had gone and our income was, yuck. we had a double mortgage and a child. And it was like it was very difficult. And I was asked up to London to, to see two publishers. And the first publisher showed me round and showed me all the books. They had these beautiful big encyclopedias. And they said, and of course, when they go out of print, well, just cut them into small pieces and do smaller books. So they were telling me their process, right? Uh, and then they, they immediately after that led me into the office and said, well, why we've called you in is because we have a, uh, We've got these wonderful pictures, and we just want to wrap a text around it. My body got up and walked out. <laughs> I didn't even say goodbye. Yes. I just walked out. I was so mm. insulted by it. One of the things on my gift is I do not do that. Mm. Yes? If I had done that, even for however much money, I would have hated myself forever, and my gift would have started to mm. turn around on the arrow coming home. Um, and then the same afternoon, I went to another publisher to whom I proposed a book. And at the end of the meeting, they said, well, we really like it. We want to do it. And I said, well, it's really nice of you to have me in here and um, to talk about this, because it was the era when online was beginning to be a thing. And they looked at me with pity and they said, you know, but if we didn't get on, we wouldn't be able to print your book. <laughs> I had those two mm. experiences on the same day. Mm. Yeah. It's not yeah, extraordinary. But I mean, there we are. Those are that's the small print mm. on my gift. If it's do it. If it's not appreciated. Take it elsewhere. Yes. Oh, such a such a wonderful you know, example. So I think you know we have to do that. But when the skill can't be used, and goodness knows we've had so many experiences of that in mm. our time. Um, I'm thinking of like you know the dancers um, in Southeast Asia who managed to keep the tradition alive, even though they were made to work in, you know, paddy fields and do hard, heavy farming work. And most of them were killed, the ones that held all the choreography. Together. So it, that, that skills come over a very mm. narrow bridge, I'm very aware of, of those sorts of, um, uh, of things. So the gift that our ancestors, have, you know, have, have given to us is very different in lots of different kinds of ways but if we don't honor it how can the world be a better place because our our skills are for that mm, service yes so we are coming up on time is there anything well uh, as you said before we began recording uh you could you could talk about this for days so i'm sure there's lots more that we <laughs> we could absolutely still talk about yeah. but... I mean, this is about this is about 85 percent of all my work yeah so i really can it's, it's working with a very extreme very difficult things that people bring because there isn't anyone else mm. doing in in the ordinary Yes, well. absolutely. Um, so it may well be that we come back and do a part two. But for now, <laughs> is there is there anything that you feel is an important um, a important message that you want to give listeners in terms of this reclamation of our ancestral connections, our understanding who our ancestors are, how to honour them? Is there anything else that you feel is important to say? I think the thing is that, you know, don't be frightened of your ancestors. I mean, meeting the ancestors is like meeting everyone else. 
you know, don't hang out with the ones that really freak you out. <laughs> there may be something that could be done with or for them another time. But, you know, um, just ask, you know, ask those that look kindly on you to be, be at your back, at your side. You know, what do I do in this situation? I have no idea what to do. Okay, ask. Mm. Um, I think it's that, you know, and it's also the saying thank you. The saying thank you. So, and, and having some forethoughtfulness to those who are after us, that's, that's our response. That's the, that's the small print on our ancestry. Mm. Forward. It's what, you know, how is this, uh, how is my life of usefulness to those that come after me? What do I need? Um, uh, and that's not just about your, your will um, and things like that. It's about the, you know, we need to cancel the forgetfulness of our, you know, uh, of our society. We need so badly um, that greater belonging. Mm. And so let's be free. Yes. Oh, really beautiful. Um, you, you reminded me when you were saying about you know, work with the ones that you you feel that connection with, you, you're not scared by. And I, I recall a few years ago, I was in uh, an ancestral ceremony and without really any intention on my part that I'm aware of, um, a, a way, way, way back ancestor came through who, from what I can understand, I've got a tiny piece of Siberian DNA and it was an ancestor from that part of the world and it was it wasn't that the the presence was you know I, I don't think it was in any way um you know negative or had any ill intent but that it, it was so so um outside of anything I've been able to be in relationship with no um and I just didn't feel ready it was a kind of thank you so much but I'm not ready for this right now um and there was I think I, perhaps there might have been a bit of a sense in me of like, oh, perhaps I should, you know, kind of accept this connection now if it's being made. But I also had this deeper sense of, no, I'm going to trust what I'm ready for and it isn't this now. Um, and so there was a kind of, you know, gratitude in that had been forthcoming, but also discernment of what what is right for me. And I, th I think that's the important thing. As you say, these are like any other relationships. They're right for certain times with certain people. Yeah. I mean, you know, the unregenerate ancestors, the, the ones that fouled up their lives and are continuing to foul up the lives of, you know, their descendants and, you know, by having started a pattern of behaviour or whatever, you know, we don't want to hang out with those. But also, you know, we also have to have compassion um, um, on on those, um, you know, very difficult things, you know, families of criminal association and all of those things which I've seen, you know, that those things do impact horribly mm. on families now alive. Um, <clears throat> and you know, those are those are areas to avoid. But, but you know, if you go back to the deep ancestors, the ones who are the ancestors of all of us, you will always find a collective memory and wisdom, which is always there. Mm. So it's not like sort of going back and asking your uncle Joe, who was felt you up a bit when you were about sort of nine. You know, it's it's not like that. It's it's not it's not that sort of thing. Um, it's it's going back into this very deep, very subtle, um, very wise um, collective of understanding, which, which is also we are part mm. of. Yes. And which we will join. Yes. <laughs> yeah. We're all ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going there. Um, <clears throat> some of us are nearer than others, so. Yeah, but I think this is say that sense of not being abandoned, um, of not being left out, of not being exiled, and uh, and to all those people who have said, "I hate my family. I'm moving to Australia." I'm afraid. Can I just say, your ancestors will be coming too. <laughs> you know, the difficult ones as well as the ones you really want to be asking. Of course, we can always ask those ancestors who were behind us. You know, to actually begin to sort of smooth mm. the path of that. 
Yes. That's something we can all do. Absolutely. That's that's all mm. we can do. Is don't be alone with that. If there's a difficulty in the family, you know, get get the the deep ancestors on the job. Mm. They they always come out. Yeah. Oh, this has been truly wonderful. Um, I'm so so glad that we uh, have had this conversation. I feel like a much needed oh, yeah. one. Really, really beautiful. And where can listeners find out more about you and the wonderful work you do? Um, I don't put anything about my shamanic practice online um, because. I would be not doing anything else. Um, my website is HalloQuest, H-A-L-L-O-W, Quest, or one word, HalloQuest at um, dot org, O-R-G dot U-K, which has all the things that I'm doing, the trainings that I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> and we've been um, teaching a, a shamanic training course now, which goes to professional standards. Um, for the last few, 35 years. Goodness. Year. Goodness. Yeah, so is it 35 years this year? I really don't know. I can't remember. But anyway, for a long time. Um, but if people want to see me personally, then um, the website does have a contact number on it, so they can uh, address so they can contact me. Wonderful. Thank you. And we'll see you. Yes, I can. I can tell that you would be inundated if you <laughs> advertise that too freely. You know, I, I, I really, I, I really, I don't advertise. I only, I really only take people from word of mouth generally. Mm. That's, that's how my life has been. But it's you know we need more hands to the pump. So you shamanic practitioners out there, you know, widen your yes. Mind. We need more of you. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. This has been such Thanks a delight. So Great to talk oh, to you. thank you. I very much hope you enjoyed watching that. And if you did and you're not already subscribed, then do hit that bell thingy and subscribe to automatically get each fresh new episode as it's released each week. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do at Be Mythical to guide and support old souls in this new world to live their own unique myth, do hop along to bemythical.com and you'll find out all the ways you can join us and go deeper with us on your own mythical journey. Lots of love for now. See you again next week.